what's up everybody i'm pirmal jagan and i'm happy to see you once again and today we are going to do something different and uh, you know very well i've done ma some malware analysis stuff in past and uh, though i did some malware analysis i couldn't touch the reverse engineering part reversing the unknown binary uh, reversing it to some low level assembly code and try to understand what it does and that part i still need to learn and i'm just taking a step towards that one and uh, for that i'm i'm going to use this video uh, you know what i mean i'm going to teach you the cpu architecture in this video and for that i'm going to use an excellent trihackme room the trihackme room explains this cpu architecture really well and uh, you may think this is an irrelevant one but this is essential the cpu architecture understanding the architecture understanding what happens within the cpu what happens within the computer at lower level is very important to reverse any unknown binary because if you want to understand a malware what it does you want to first learn how a system handles that binary right so for that you need to understand this architecture stuff and its fundamentals and i'm going to as i said i'm going to teach you that architecture stuff here and uh, without further ado let me introduce that uh, room to you now you are looking at my window and it is the trihackme room that i'm talking about x86 architecture overview x86 is nothing but the 32 bit uh, processor uh, so that's what they are trying to denote so let me explain that a crash course in x86 architecture to enable us in malware reverse engineering well there will be a lot of theory in this if you listen this with some patience then you will be able to understand this very clearly all right so let me explain this uh, uh, i mean I'll, i'll begin with that intro part okay and here you may see malware often works abusing the systems that are designed therefore to understand how malware works it's essential to know the architecture of the systems that the malwares are running on that's what i mentioned at the beginning in this room we will learn brief overview of x83 x86 architecture and let me clearly explain this this room is going to explain some theoretical stuff and it's going to explain the fundamentals of the cpu function and i'm not going to show any practical uh, demo in this this is just a theory but if you understand this theory you'll be able to understand the program that i'm going to show at the end of this video so that's the gist of this and please note that there might be a lot of details about x86 architecture that are all irrelevant for us because we are going to learn reverse engineering through this so for that what is the uh, necessary content in x86 architecture that's what i'm going to explain here the learning objective in this video we are going to learn the cpu architecture and what are all the components of cpu and different types of registers that a cpu contains and also what is the purpose of uh, each register and the memory layout as viewed by the program so when when you load a program it could be notepad wordpad any program on your system when you load that program how that program see the memory so i'm going to explain that as well and also the stack layout and uh, i'll explain what is stack here in a moment okay so let's dive in i complete this section and i'm just checking the next topic cpu architecture overview okay so let me adjust this cap uh, yeah cpu architecture overview so this this diagram clearly explains the the, uh, the architecture of cpu so this is the architecture they call as von neumann architecture all right so this is the uh, format the architecture of the cpu you may see the cpu it's a, it it is actually a block it contain it, it contains multiple components like registers arithmetic logic unit control unit so, so these are the three main components of uh, a processor and you may see some external components like main memory uh, main memory which is nothing but the ram random access memory or volatile memory you may call and the input output devices the input output devices are nothing but any device that you connect with your system it could be a monitor it could be a keyboard mouse microphone camera etc any other device okay so all the devices are connected to your cpu your computer okay so that's what this uh, architecture denotes well um 
you may see uh, I'll, I'll explain what each unit does so before that let's get to know what is this uh, the three components arithmetic and logic unit the name itself denotes arithmetic so it does some arithmetic operations uh, addition subtraction the actions like this and control unit and registers the cpu interacts with memory and input output devices uh, outside cpu so that's that that's you need to understand first let's understand this control unit you may see the control unit it presents within the cpu and it actually interacts with the ram so you can just uh, see this uh, diagram and try to visualize how it functions okay the control unit and you may see the control unit gets instructions from the main memory uh, as you see the arrow mark here which is connected to ram you can understand like this the main memory that often supplies that often feeds the cpu so it gives the data to CPU and the control unit is the one who gets the instructions from RAM and it just executes that. So, I mean, I think the control unit's part is to get the instructions from RAM and supply it to CPU and, and that's what it does. Well, the control unit, is, control unit is itself the integral part of CPU. Well, that's a different story. The control unit gets instructions from the main memory depicted here outside CPU. The address to the next instruction to execute is stored in a register called instruction pointer which is very important i'll explain what is register in a moment but just keep this in mind the address of the next instruction to execute is often gets stored in the instruction pointer okay and you may see the name of the instruction pointer here well uh, whenever we mention the letter e in front of a register it it, it denotes a 32 bit architecture when we denote r in front of a register it denotes the 64 bit architecture if you go to any website if you want to try so i mean if you want to download some uh, binary some 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 program for example let me go to maybe wireshark i go to this website okay you may see this uh, here it says the architecture of the cpu x64 is nothing but the 64 bit architecture like this whenever you go to any software uh, uh, i mean any website to download some files some software the architecture is defined all right so now um so that, that that's what the architecture is all about uh, x64 uh, and x32 all right uh, arithmetic and logic unit as i said before it does the arithmetic operations like addition subtraction so that's what they gave here and the results of the executed instruction are stored in either a register or main memory that's actually an additional point that you need to remember so whatever the additional uh, i mean whatever the operation that performed by elu it gets stored either in the register or main memory all right you can just whatever the theory that i am saying you can just visualize visualize it with this diagram all right so that it will be easy for you to understand then the next one registers the registers are the cpu storage well as I said, the main memory, the RAM is, is a storage, but it's a different storage. It's, it's a, of course a volatile memory, but it has a decent size. And there is another memory that is out of the context, the disk. That is also a memory where the files we store, right? Uh, statically, we store the files. That is a disk. But the main memory, the RAM, that's where the, the, the data gets stored dynamically in runtime. I hope you uh, got what I'm trying to say. The volatile memory the data gets stored on ram temporarily when the program runs so i'll try to explain that and the register that i'm that i was talking about as i say as, as they mentioned here it's a cpu storage so here you may see this block this is also a storage a, a small container the size of these registers are literally small uh, i mean uh, compared to the uh, the main memory the ram which is very small um, the CPU registers, the CPU memory used to handle the uh, temporary uh, values. Uh, I mean, um, how can I explain this? To store the data temporarily during the execution. So that's how you can uh, understand this. Registers are generally, generally much smaller than main memory, I just mentioned, which is outside CPU. The main memory is outside CPU to help saving the time uh, executing the instructions. Well. Though, I mean, since we have the registers within the CPU itself, it saves the time. So the CPU stores some, some small values within the registers itself 
and it saves a lot of time during the during the execution all right uh, the ne the next thing is memory ram so whenever i mention the term memory you need to assume it's ram okay at the memory also called main memory or ram contains all the code and data a program to run so let me uh, explain this for example i am having this sublime text uh, an application a text editor when i click this and load this program what happens so it has a certain code and certain data this program so when i click and executed it this uh, I, i got this pop up window i got this uh, sublime text editor but behind the scenes lot of stuff happened what happened the data belongs to this sublime text loaded into ram i'll try to explain this i'm going to task manager and you can see the sublime text it loaded lot of its component into ram you can see the ram here its memory and also its size so out of my whole ram this program occupied this much of memory got it so what happens the data related to every program when when it, when the program is launched it loads all those data into memory okay when a user executes program its code and data are loaded into memory where the cpu access it one instruction at time so when the all the contents loaded into ram the, the those content those contents are accessed by the cpu the processor it takes one instruction at a time and it processes the data and it gives uh the details it gives the outcome to the input output devices the processor actually processing all the data it actually uh, uh get the data from the input output devices and sends the data to the input output devices and it actually interacts with the ram it does multiple stuff okay um then the input output devices which is actually a simple part as i said before it could be a microphone camera monitors keyboard mouses any device that you connect to your cpu okay that's the input output device fine fine enough uh let's 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 try to answer these questions in which part of the one human architecture are the code and data required for a program to run uh stored it's memory right it's ram or memory uh memory is the answer and what part of cpu stores small amounts of data well as i said registers registers are also memories but it's it it present within the cpu itself so that that should be the answer uh, registers yeah that's the answer in which unit are arithmetic operations performed i already i already mentioned it it's alu arithmetic logic unit okay so let's try to answer that arithmetic logic unit fine and i'm moving to the next section registers overview so let's try to learn about the temporary uh, temporary storage registers registers are cpu storage medium cpu can access data from registers quicker than any other storage medium because which is, which is present within the cpu itself however its limited size means it has to be used effectively uh, the the storage space of register is very less significantly less so it has to be used efficiently that's what they try to uh, mention here and they are actually classifying i mean to use this registers effectively they are just classifying it into various types and the first type is instruction pointer and the second type is general purpose registers and the third one is status flag registers and the fourth one is segment registers fine so let's get through this uh, i mean let's go through this each uh, types the first one is instruction pointers you can see the name the name itself denotes instruction pointer it's pointing to something it's pointing to some instruction okay so let's try to understand that the instruction pointer is a register that contains the address of the next instruction to be executed by the cpu so i clearly mentioned the cpu reads the content that are loaded into ram memory right so it actually processes one instruction at a time so what happens uh, when it process one instruction it needs to know what is the next instruction to process and it needs some address so when the contents are loaded into memory let me explain this when all the contents are loaded into this memory it needs some address maybe i'll try to write this write down this address here in a moment 
Um, okay. Just create a box like this. So there will be a certain address for each instruction. Okay. So there will be a certain uh, address that is called memory address for each instruction. Okay. So what it does? Uh, this uh, the instruction pointer it actually contains the address of the next instruction to get executed by the CPU. So the CPU will obviously check the instruction pointer for the next instruction. Okay, so the instruction pointer is continuously gets changed because when one instruction is executing, one instruction is uh, processed it actually points to the next one. When the next instruction is gets executed, it points to the, the next one. So like that, the instruction pointer keeps changing. All right. So you may see that the uh, denotion, I mean, how it's denoted. Uh, the 32 bit register is often called EIP, extended instruction pointer. And the R, the 64 bit uh, systems contain the RIP, uh, register instruction pointer. The R means register. All right. So this is how you need to denote the instruction pointer and also this is the definition of the, uh, the instruction pointer. Well, going to the next one, we already covered the instruction pointer. I'm moving to general purpose registers. So it's plural, there are multiple registers. The general purpose registers in x86 uh, systems are 32-bit registers. So x86 nothing but the 32-bit system. I'll tell you how this name came x86. Uh, I think the, the, the old ancient processor was uh, 8086. It was actually uh, a 16 bit architecture. Uh, then they actually evolved, the, the processor evolved and it became 32 bit architecture. Since it evolved from 16, they just gave the name like x86, extended 86. The 16 bit uh, processor name was uh, 8086, right? So then when it uh, evolved, they named it like extended 86 so that that is how it this name came extended 86 is nothing but it doesn't mean it is 86 bit it is just 32 bit all right as the name suggests they are just during the general execution of cpu the 62 bit 62 bit systems uh, these are registers okay fine the 62 bit systems the registers known as 64 bit registers 80 to 86 uh, systems which is nothing but the 32 bit systems 32 bit registers all right I hope I am not confusing it. Fine. Now, before we are going through all these uh, general purpose registers, let's try to read this and understand. You can see this, the length, the whole block. It's actually denoted as RAX. Uh, the A, the register, the A register. Okay. The A means accumulator. Okay. Uh, this is the accumulator register. You can see the full length RAX. You mean, as I said before, if there is R, then you can assume like it is for 64 bit systems. So the total length is 64 bit. They are just dividing it into half and the half of the length is EAX, which is nothing but the 32 bit. Uh, then they are dividing this EAX further and they are keeping the half and they are just naming it as AX 16 bit. And they are dividing the 16 bit into two and it's, it is actually AH and AL, the lower 8 bit higher 8 bit okay so that is how you need to uh, understand this uh, uh, the the size the the bit of every architecture okay uh, fine now let me explain this eax or rax as i said it is an accumulator register it's a storage what kind of values get stored in this accumulator register result of arithmetic operations are often stored in this register so when they perform addition or subtraction it results get stored in arithmetic register. All right. So as I said before, I don't want to repeat it again. I mean, I don't want to repeat it. 32 bit systems, 32 bit register, 64 bit system, RAX register. So that one you can keep in mind. Okay. The B, uh, EBX or uh, RBX, the register is also called base register. So the letter A denotes accumulator, the letter B denotes base. So it will be easy for us to uh, remember. Uh, the base register is often used to, uh, to store the base address for referencing an offset. I'll try to explain this later, but you can just keep like this in your mind. So it stores some sort of base address. Okay, fine. Moving to the next one. 
ECX or uh, RCX. It's called counter register. So by, by seeing its name, you might have an insight. Counter, it's counting something. It, 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 it just remember the count. Okay, so that is how, I mean, uh, for that purpose only this register gets used. It's used for remembering the counting operations such as loops. So when it is executing some loop, it has to remember how many uh, iteration going on. I mean, what is the iteration number is currently going on. So to remember that it's using a register like ECX or RCX. And the next one is EDX or RDX. The name D denotes data, it's data register. So it does used in multiplication uh, and division operations. So keep, keep one thing in mind, the accumulator register actually uh, processes uh, and keeps the value of uh, uh, the addition and the subtraction operation and the EDX, the data register, it actually keeps the values of uh, division and uh, multiplication operations. So you can keep, you can relate both these registers, all right, fine. Uh, I'm moving to the next one, ESP or RSP. So the register is called stack pointer. So I'll explain what is stack here in a moment, but you can just keep in mind like stack pointer, okay? It points top of the stack and it is used conjunction with stack segment register. Fine, there, there are a lot of things given here. First of all, you need to understand stack, right? I'll explain the stack here in a moment but before that just keep in mind ESP is nothing but a stack pointer all right and the base pointer uh, the register is called base pointer it is also used to, to access the parameters passed by the stack uh, again the lot of things about stack but you not you need to understand what is stack first of all I'll explain that so I'll just leave these two parts so I'll explain these two parts once I explain the stack all right uh, moving to the next one ESI or RSI, uh, source index, yeah, source index, uh, extended source index or register source index for 32-bit uh, and 64-bit architectures respectively. This register is called source index registers. It's used for string operations, uh, string operations and used for, used with data segment register as an offset. All right, uh, you need to understand what this register is. So it's actually a part of a segment register. I'll explain this in a moment. Uh, but just keep in mind, it's used in a string operations. And the EDA opposite, destination index. And it is also used in string operations. So these two, you can relate. You can relate these two. Fine. And the next one is R8 to R15. This is another general purpose register. And... Uh, these are all the 64-bit uh, general purpose register, which is which are not present in the 32-bit systems anymore. Um, they clearly mentioned that only. They were present, they were introduced in 64-bit systems only. And for example, for R8 register, we can use R8D for lower 34-bit addressing and R8W for lower 16-bit addressing. What they are trying to say is like this. They are splitting this, uh, the whole uh, register structure into half half and they are naming it each half they are addressable in 32 bit 16 bit and 80 bit 8 bit for example for r8 register we can use r8 d d means d word d word is nothing but 32 bit okay that denotes 32 bit and the word word means 16 bit i mean the d word means the d means double double word one word is 16 bit double word is 32 bit and byte means 8 bit 8 bit equal to 1 byte so that, that that is the equation and here the suffix d stands for double word w stands for word and b stands for byte so these are all the fundamentals these are all the basics when you learn uh, the uh, operating system basics you will often encounter this kind of uh, terms so you need to make sure you remember these terms okay fine let's try to answer these questions which register holds the address of next instruction that, that needs to be executed? Yes, it's actually an instruction pointer. That's what I explained at the beginning. So let's answer this. Instruction pointer. That's the right answer. Which register in 32-bit system is also called counter register? So it's try to count something, right? 
so which is in 32 bit system that's the hint so when you hear 32 bit system the letter is e extended okay so the first letter is e and counter register it's used to count something the first letter of it c okay and x e c x that's the answer all right and uh, which registers from the ones discussed above are not present in 32 bit systems the last one this is what we learned we said these registers are specific to 64 bit systems so that should be the answer r8 to r15 there are uh, 8 9 10 there are totally 8 registers for this all right i'm moving to the next one we are continuing to register so far we covered all the general purpose registers there were uh, huge numbers uh, i mean they were in huge numbers and uh, session pointers we covered we need to cover the status flag register and segment register so so far we are just trying to cover the specific structure registers all right continuing this uh, the status flag registers so let me explain what is the purpose of it when performing execution some indication about the status of execution is sometimes required this is where the status flag comes in the name itself indicates these registers contain some statuses some status about the execution and you can see how it's denoted this is a single 32 bit register for 32 bit system called e flags extended flags which is extended into 64 bit systems called r flags okay so it's actually denoted as flags all right the status flag register consists of uh, individual single single bit flags that can be either one or zero some of the necessary flags that are discussed okay so it's actually uh, contains the value in a bit phase manner if it is true one if it is false then zero that's how it contains the value okay let's explain i mean let me explain the status flag the types of status flag registers the first one is zero flag what is the register what kind of thing it contains it denoted as zf zero flag indicates when the result of last execution was zero for example the previous operation it does some subtraction it's subtracting a value from the same value what would be the uh, result zero so when there is a result of the previous instruction is zero this actually this zero flag register is set which means this value is set to one because the previous instruction result was the instruction or the instruction currently executing uh, the result of that instruction is zero so it is actually set the, its value is set to one so that is how you need to understand for example if an instruction is executed subtract rax from itself uh, doing the arithmetic operation subtraction so doing the subtract and sub subtraction from the same value so result will be zero so in the in this scenario this specific zero flag register is set to one okay so this is the purpose of this zero flag register the next one is carry flag register denoted by cf the carry flag indicates when the last executed instruction resulted in a, 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 in a number that is too big or too small for the destination at the time this carry flag register is set this uh, this value is set to 1 okay let me explain this scenario what what does i mean what does i mean what do they mean the number is too big or too small i'll explain this now let's take this one count these digits this is actually an hexadecimal number count these digits 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 there are eight digits okay which means it is 32 bit i'll explain each digits denotes four bits okay f denotes four bit there are totally eight f's so four into eight 32 so this is the 32 bit register value and actually this is the maximum value of 32 bit okay and this one this is the smaller value just one just nothing but just one we are denoting the value one in hexadecimal format so this is the hexadecimal denotion of uh, depiction of one so what they are doing they are just trying to add the maximum value of 32 bit register and a minimum value of 32 32 bit register the smallest value of 32 bit register and 
when they try to add these two values and store it in a 32 bit register it actually exceeds its capacity capacity of 32 bit register so what happens there will be a value that exceeds there will be a value of 1 that exceeds this capacity and that when 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 the result exceeds this register's capacity this specific register is set okay i think i am explaining it without confusing you so try to uh, uh, i mean you, you 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 may not able to understand this in just one attempt you may try to read this again and again to understand this okay that is how i got it and uh, the next one is sign flag uh, the sign flag or sf indicates if the result of an operation is negative or most significant bit is set to uh, 1 so for example let me explain this one i'll take this one and i'm converting x to binary conversion i'll go here i'll put this hex number this is the hexadecimal denotation i'm just converting it to binary you may see this is the binary you see 32 digits so all the digits are set to 1 so this is the equivalent uh, this is the binary equivalent of this hexadecimal number and you can see this is the maximum number all the all the bits are set to 1 so this is the maximum number fine now what is the most significant bit so when you convert this hexadecimal number to binary binary digit you see this one these things these bits are considered as most significant bits because uh, I think there will be uh, there will be uh, uh, an explanation. So let me try to explain this. For example, so I need to just change this size. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think it looks fine now. Okay, now let me explain this. For example, I have four bits. Okay, four bits are nothing but half byte okay uh, here the value will be like 1 2 4 8 okay now let me explain this for example uh, this bit is set to 0 this bit is set to 1 this bit is set to 0 and this bit is set to 1 now how you need to calculate how you need to uh, calculate the decimal number from this uh, you need to take the, I mean, if it is set to 1, you need to set, take that value, respective value. If it is set to 1, you need to take the respective value. Like this, uh, since we got, I mean, we, we knew the, this, this one is set, so the value is 1. And this one is set, the value is 4. So add these two. So the total value is 5. So this is the binary equivalent of the value 5. The, 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 byte, the bit act, uh, equivalent of uh, 5. Similarly, if all the bits are set, then you need to add all these values. 8, 4, 2, 1. Just nothing but 15. So that denotes F in hexadecimal form. Okay. So this is actually a half byte. So when you just put like this, this is the byte. Okay. 1 byte is equal to 8 bit. Okay. Uh, each f denotes 4 bit 4 bit 4 bit 8 bits 1 byte so this is the 1 byte if you file if you open any file in a hex editor you will see the bytes okay so each byte denotes 8 bits so this is the fundamental uh, i'll just clear this i go to here uh, yeah now i think you have an insight so when you are adding the maximum value of the 32 bit register and also the lowest value together the value obviously exceeds so when it when there is kind of that that kind of uh, a too big value to get stored in a register uh, in that case this carry flag is set fine the sign flag and also yeah I, I think i was explaining the sign flag sign flag indicates the most significant bit so as i said uh, the I, I actually drawn right 8 4 2 1 that 8 4 are considered as the most significant bit because that has the higher value so that's what they try to uh, explain here uh, yeah that's what they try to explain uh, 
these conditions are met the sf is set to 1 otherwise it's set it, it's set to 0 so it, it's actually an uh, either extreme the result of operation is negative or the most significant bit is set uh, most significant bit set to 1 which means the higher value so if it meets any of the extreme uh, event it actually the sign flag is set to 1 so this is the explanation well the next one trap flag the trap flag indicates the processor in debugging mode which is very easy to understand so simple this register is set to 1 when you are running a binary in a debugging mode in debugging mode the cpu instructions happens one by one slowly so it can be controlled right so when a binary or program runs in a debugging mode the trap flag is set to 1 simple okay now here is the table it actually explains the general purpose register that we have seen so far i mean we've seen before and the status registers also we've seen instruction pointer we've seen but the segment registers we had to see but they gave the list of registers and it's i mean the type of registers and the registers belongs to each type fine we are going to the segment register what is the purpose of it segment registers are 16 bit registers that converts the flat memory space into different segments for easier understanding all right uh, okay i'll explain the memory segments first now you are I'm, I'm just moving to the next topic just to understand the memory structure uh, now we have seen the list of uh, the types of registers and also its uh, i mean uh, the classification of registers and its each type of uh, the register and now we are going to the main memory how it's structured okay uh, i just opened this memory overview look at this this is the main memory it has four sections stack heap code data uh, this order could be changed it, it could be changed okay so just keep in mind stack heap code and data okay so the main memory is uh, splitted into various types that's what they are trying to explain here in the segment register segment registers are 16 bit register that converts flat memory space space into different segments for easy addressing okay so, so, so the name itself indicates it's segmenting the memory that's it fine the code segment uh, the code segment register points to the code section of the memory so what it does this register is obviously a storage space it contains some value it is segmenting the memory space so what are all the segment it done so it just points to that respective segment the code segment for example so which is actually one of the segments of memory the code segment register points to the code section of memory the name itself indicates very simple and the data segment register points to the program's data section and the stack segment register points to the program's stacks memory program stack memory simple and the extra segment you can see this one it has three registers es fs gs these extra segment registers point to different data sections and uh, these and ds registers divide the program's memory into four distinct data sections uh, fine so so far we have seen uh, as a register for each memory segment except heap now we have an extra segment which is related to this data section i'll explain this it has three registers and also here we have one register called data register data segment register so there are totally four register and these four registers actually divide the program's data memory into four distinct sections i think that's what i understood from this line okay so this is how you need to understand fine we will try to answer the questions which flag is used by the program to identify it's being run on the debugger i clearly mentioned it is trap flag yeah and which flag will be set when the most significant bit in an operation is set to one so that is nothing but this uh, sign flag because when the operation is negative or the most significant bit is set to one the sign flag is set obviously sign fine sign flag and which segment register contains the pointer 
to the code section in memory. The name itself indicates code segment register. So that's what the answer. Uh, code register. That's the answer. Code segment. Yeah, that's the answer. Code segment register. Fine. Now let's go to this memory overview. So I explained already which what is the uh, parts of memory and let's try to understand each parts of memory. When program is loaded into memory, when program loaded into memory in the Windows operating system, it sees the abstracted view of the memory, uh, which is nothing but a program can see only its memory, the memory that it, it owns. So every program runs in its its own memory space of Windows operating system. So that's what the uh, the kernel does. I think it, it allocates the memory space for each program from the RAM. So this means that the program doesn't have access to full memory. Instead, it only has access to its memory. For that program, that's all the memory it needs. For the sake of brevity, we will not go into detail on how operating system perform abstraction. We will look into memory as program see it. So this is the this is the way, this is the structure that any program sees its memory. Okay, fine. Uh, this program here is an overview of typical memory layout of a program. As can be seen, memory is divided into four sections, same. Uh, while we have shown the four sections in particular order, this can be different from how they will be all the time. Four section can be shown in the below data section. Okay, now try to understand each section of memory in detail. Code section. The code section, the name implies it contains program's code. So this code section, uh, this specific code segment register actually pointed to this code section of the memory. So the code segment register is, uh, register is pointed like this. So let me draw this. CS register. I think I need to use a different color. Uh, yeah, I use blue. The CS register is pointing this, and uh, yeah, it actually contains the program's code. Specifically, this section refers to the text section in the pro portable executable file. Uh, I'll actually explain this in a different section because we need to a uh, different video because I need to create another video to explain the PE header or the PE file structure. So when I explain that, you will get to know what is the text section in the portable executable file. So it's actually a different section of, uh, uh, I mean, it's actually a separate section that contains the code of the program. So it is actually given the executable privilege because it's being executed by the CPU. Fine, by, by the program, uh, which includes the instruction executed by CPU. Uh, this section of the memory has execute permissions. Fine. Now I'm moving to the data section. And the data section contains the initialized data that is not variable or remain constant. So the data section always contains the constant values like global variables or some value that doesn't change throughout the execution. So those those things will be stored in this specific data uh, data section. Fine. Then the next one is heap. The next two topics are very vital because uh, I mean. These next two topics very, I mean, uh, how, how can I say, these two topics are vital with respect to malware analysis and reverse engineering because these two places uh, were often uh, exploited by the threat actors, okay? So I'll try to explain this. Uh, you can see, you, I mean, you might, you might have seen the terms like heap-based buffer overflow, stack-based buffer overflow. So obviously these are all, these two parts are very important. This heap is also known as a dynamic memory, contains variables and data created and destroyed during program execution. So while the program executed, it might be creating some value, it might be deleting some value. So obviously there will be some memory adjustments happening. So those things uh, actually uh, contained by this, I mean, uh, consisted by this uh, uh, heap memory, which is actually a dynamic memory, it's always changing. When the variable is created, the memory is allocated for the variable at runtime. 
and when the variable is deleted the memory is freed all right it's, everything is happening during the runtime because it's a dynamic memory happening runtime the next one is stack so I, I i said i'm going to explain this in a moment so let me explain what is the stack so the stack is actually uh, uh, one of the important parts of memory according to malware analysis that's what i mentioned the section of the memory contains local variables arguments passed to the to the program if you are passing some arguments to a program or some local variables then it will be stored in that stack and also the return address of the parent process that of the called program you may see return address of the parent process of the called program for example um how can i say this um i am having a cmd for example i am in a powershell right now okay uh, from here i am calling notepad okay now the notepad program is the kali program and the cmd is uh, the powershell is the caller program powershell is the one who called the cm uh, the notepad now the thing is the parent process now if you see the process structure go to this task manager I'll, uh, I'll I'll check the PowerShell. Where is PowerShell? Ah, here is the Notepad. The Notepad actually the parent process of the Notepad should be PowerShell, the terminal. To view this detailed view, so I'll I'll just explain this uh, orally. The PowerShell, that's the one who launched the Notepad. So the PowerShell is actually the parent process, and the Notepad is actually the child process. All right. So, or, or else you can take this as an example. The terminal, it's a terminal, Windows terminal application. It actually launched the PowerShell. The PowerShell is a child and the terminal application is the parent process. So, once this execution is done, once the notepad is done, notepad is done, I mean, uh, once the work done in notepad, when I close this notepad, it has to move to PowerShell. For example, uh, when I close this uh, notepad, it will give the It will it will just uh, uh, get back to the PowerShell. I think uh, I'm, I'm just trying to uh, explain it clear. Uh, fine. So this is the parent and child process relationship. The parent is the one who called the child. So the word itself uh, indicates some hierarchy. Okay. Since the return address is related to the control flow of the CPU instructions, the stack is often targeted by the malware to hijack the control flow. And the stack-based buffer overflow is often heard by the researchers. Um, or the people in the infosec domain since the return address is related to the control flow of cpu instructions fine uh, since the stack is having the return address of the parent process it could be manipulated when hacker able to manipulate the value of the return address then they will be able to redirect that when they, they when they will be able to uh, uh, i mean where they will be able to uh, take over the ex control i mean uh, take over the control of the program the complete execution so that's what i'm trying to explain fine i'll, I'll explain that i'll explain that uh, fine when a program loaded into memory does it have full view of system memory no because the program has the view of its memory alone so it's false when section of the memory contains code what what section of uh, memory contains code the name itself indicates code section which memory section contains information related to programs control flow stack stack also contains the local variables and arguments that are passed into the program so that's another additional data to remember fine i need to explain the structure of stack in a moment so that one i'll explain in the next one uh, I've, I've, I've given this diagram so this is the structure of uh, stack they mention but i'll try to simplify that uh, let me draw this. I go here. Uh, clear this. Yeah. And uh, come down. Maybe I need to. Yes. Okay. Right here. Uh, I'll uh, write this. Just huge. Now you are seeing a container. Okay, so let's assume this is a stack. Okay, here you are actually pushing 
some values push means putting uh, data within the stack so that is the operation called push okay when you are taking some value out of the stack that is called pop okay fine now you are pushing some value within the stack the first value second value the third value okay like this you are pushing some value fine now uh, if you want to take any value out of the stack then you need to tag uh, you need to take the value that inserted last that is what they call it as lif last in first out so the value that inserted last that has to be come out first when popping so that is the structure of stack and also i heard the stack actually growing backwards which means so when you are putting the value within the stack i'll uh, when you are putting the value within the stack its value is getting reduced uh, high to low so the stack is always gro growing backwards so you need to keep that that point also in your mind so this is the structure of stack all right yeah i'll go here and uh, just try to explain this the stack is part of programs memory that contains argument passed on to program local variables and the programs control flow this makes the stack very important regarding the mal the same stuff and the stack is following the lifo last in first out that's what i just explained so whatever the content inserted in the stack last that has to be come out first and this means the last element pushed out for the same stuff they are explaining uh, the cpu uses the registers to keep track of this stack uh, and the cpu uses two registers to keep track of the stack so it actually using two registers to track this stack flow uh, to uh, to track this uh, stack so let me explain that that's what i just left uh, where it is yeah stack pointer base pointer okay i'll i'll just try to explain my explanation might be wrong but that is this is how i remember about this uh, yeah now here i am me scroll up this little bit now i think you will be able to see this clearly uh, yeah. now you can see this uh, here i am having base pointer this is actually a register and here i am having a stack pointer so this is actually another register okay this register contain the value of stack stop element address i suppose and the base pointer contains the value of stacks bottom pointer uh, uh, i mean it points to the stacks bottom so i think that's what uh, my understanding from this uh, all right you can you can just correct me if i if i'm mentioning anything wrong just a, a beginner trying to learn this stuff as a beginner so you may correct me feel free to correct me no issues at all fine uh, yeah stack pointer that's what I, i i just explained the stack pointer points the top of the stack i just pointed and show when any new element is pushed on to stack the location of the stack pointer changes and consider the new element that was pushed on to stack similarly the when element popped out okay when an element pushed or popped in the stack the the position of stack pointer changes it keeps changing it always points the top of the stack so that one you need to understand the base pointer the base pointer for any program remains constant this is reference to the address of the current program the stack tracks uh, its local variable and arguments fine uh, i think you could see the base pointer and the stack pointer's value here uh, you may see it actually goes from high to low uh, it's growing it's, it's growing backwards so you need to add values like this the first value you need to add is the argument one second one is argument 2 return address ebp then local variable one local variable two local variable three so this is how you need to add uh let me draw this you need to add it 
this way okay um, fine I clear this go here and uh, let me explain this old base pointer and return address you may see this the base pointer is pointed to the saved EBP and also you can see the return address before that before the base pointer lies the old base pointer of the calling program the program that calls the current program the below old pointer lies the return address the below the old pointer lies the return address where the instruction pointer will return once the current program execution ends fine uh, actually here it has the return address and it actually has the base pointer after the return address and after the uh, after the, the base pointer is set the stack is started filling filled by the local variable and the stack pointer is pointed at the top of the stack okay now once the execution is done all these values are popped out and the program is returned to this return address okay so this is the stuff they are trying to explain here a common technique to hijack the control flow is to overflow the local variable on the stack such as overrides return address with an address of the malware author's choice so let me explain this what uh, i mean this is actually uh, not within the context of this specific uh, topic but i'll try to explain this uh, you may see the local variables which is actually controlled by the user who executes the program so when you control this specific local variables you can simply try to write the local variable beyond its uh, beyond its boundary and uh, you can just try to overwrite this ebp and return address you can just try to uh, uh, you know uh, overflow try to go beyond the boundary of uh, this local variable and you can try to manipulate this return address uh, since you were able to control the local variable and that's where uh, the buffer overflow occurs so when you are able to manipulate this return address you can just uh, control its execution you can just uh, redirect the CPU to uh, execute your stuff instead of uh, what it's supposed to run. Okay. And uh, arguments. The arguments being passed to function are pushed to, to stack before the function starts execution. These arguments are present right below the return address on the stacks. Okay. The arguments you can see here. So arguments present below the return address in the stack. As I said, I'm just considering the top elements as a bottom element because it grows backwards. Okay. Uh, so this is the bottom, bottom element so before the program function starts executing the arguments are uh, pushed into stack that's what they are trying to explain and uh, function prologue and uh, epilogue it's actually a big topic so let me explain this topic in a moment when a function is called the stack is prepared for the function to execute so when there is a function call the stack has to prepare for function to execute okay this means that the arguments are pushed into the stack before the start of the execution the, pre the preparation is nothing but it's just pushing the argument one and two in the stack after that the return address and the old base pointer pushed into stack the return address and the old base pointer pushed into stack once these elements are pushed the base pointer address is changed to the top of the stack so once all these elements are pushed the local variables are yet to be pushed so the stack pointer is uh, obviously here along with the base pointer as the function executes the stack pointer moves as per the requirement to the function so when the function starts executing the local variable start started pushed into the stack so when it started pushed the stack pointer obviously moved to the top of the stack so it actually points the local variable that pushed last this portion of code pushes the argument uh, this portion of code that pushes the argument and the return address and the base pointer on the stack and dearranges the stack base pointer called is called a function prologue so so what are all the process that are happening before a function call and also addition of return address and the ebp so this thing is called prologue and epilogue is nothing but the opposite function when the function execution is about to stop it has to return to the parent function then it actually try to restore it right so that's what the epilogue similarly the old base pointer is popped out they are just pointing out this base pointer and also when the uh, 
uh, return address is popped out of the instruction pointer. When the return address is popped, I mean, when the return address is popped out of the instruction pointer, uh, it's actually processed by the CPU. It actually gets the return address from the stack, and it uh, it actually uh, moves the execution to that return address. The stack pointer rearranges to point the top of the stack. The part of the code that performs this action is called epilog. So the reversal of the prologue is epilog. Okay. Now, fine. I'll I'll try to uh, take this uh, exercise. Uh, we have limited time, so available stack space. So this is the stack space. I need to push the argument first. Uh, how can I do this? Maybe like this, or like this, or whole DBT like this. Okay, I need to move to the base pointer first. Not a not, not a stack pointer. Okay, argument one. Okay, I think it it is a, this is the higher address and lower address. So it is actually growing backwards. So I didn't I didn't notice this. So I have only 20 seconds remaining. Argument one, two, and the uh, EBP. Sorry, EBP point here. Uh, before that, uh, it's called a CBP, right? Then address, okay. Base pointer, yeah, here like this. And uh, local variable one, local variable two. Okay, to restart this game. Okay, let me take this, retake this game. Higher address, lower address is going backwards. So we need to add values like this, downwards. Okay, I am adding the argument one here, argument two, and uh, return address, and uh, EBP, the base pointer, and uh, local variable one, local variable two, and the base pointer supposed to point here, and the stack pointer is supposed to point the top of the stack, or like this. Yeah, now I got the flag. So. An easy exercise to take just to understand the structure of stack. All right, um, I'm going to the conclusion part, uh, which is nothing but what are all we have learned. So nothing much here. So with this, we have finished this room, but I'm not going to end with this. I'm just going to explain all the stuff that I explained so far with some real example, just one, one real example. Um, now you are looking at my code, my C program, I just wrote a simple code, a simple C program, and you can see that I just added it twice. I need to remove this. No issues at all. Uh, yesterday I wrote a, a, a library, a basic library to handle the input and output functions. And uh, here I created, oh sorry, when, when you are reviewing every any code, you need to begin with the main program. So here is the main, main function. So here is the main function. In main function, I am printing hello world, a message. And I'm actually printing something. What is that? I'm calling a function. I'm calling a function called add. I'm adding the values 10 and 20. So this is the function of addition. So when I try to add these two values, so it, it is actually, I'm, I'm calling the function. So the execution goes to this function call add. So here I'm just trying to add two integers and the result is stored in the variable called result. Uh, the result is returned as this function outcome. Okay, so when I when I print this uh, addition function, so it results the value 30. Now this is the C program, and it has to be compiled. Okay, now let me go here. I already compiled it, but just for the sake of uh, uh, demonstration, I'm just gonna compile it once again. I have the same path. All right. Now I have my program, and I have already installed GCC, uh, a GNOME compiler. I think I'm pronouncing it properly, gnome, what, whatever. Um, I'm calling my C program and the output file, I need to st uh, store it as uh, adder, maybe adder, name adder. Okay, now I try to explain this, uh, I'm, I'm trying to, uh, ex uh, sorry, execute this adder binary. When I adder, uh, when I execute adder, it prints the hello world and also the addition of value uh, 10 and 20. So this is my program. Now I, ha now I have this program. I'm going to open this binary in uh, a disassembler. And I'm going to see the assembly view of this function. And I try to explain 
what is prologue, what is epilogue, and how the uh, the flow occurs. Uh, binary ninja. Fine. I'm starting this. I already loaded this when I was practicing. I I need to open this once again. I since I changed the name. Now I have loaded this. I am using this binary ninja free edition to showcase this. This is actually one of the disassembler. I found this disassembler was uh, easy for me to understand the assembly code. So that's why I'm I'm just using this. Uh, I'm I'm viewing the linear view and also the disassembly. I'll choose disassembly. Um, I go to main function. Now you are seeing the main function and looking look at this. Uh, these three code. They are nothing but the prologue. So the main function before it starts calling the uh, function, it is actually arranging the prologue. It is trying to uh, pass the arguments and it is trying to uh, put the uh, BP, the base pointer and it's setting the return address. You may see this EBP. It's pushing the base pointer first and also it is actually changing the stack pointer it, it is setting the stack pointer into base pointer so when whenever you are seeing uh, assembly instruction like this you need to understand first of all this one and also its operands okay uh, the stack pointer is set to base pointer so that's what it means it's moving the stack pointer to base pointer which means it is setting the both stack pointer and base pointer at same place because there is no elements yet and um, it is actually giving the value to some stack pointer and you can see uh, here is the main function so let me i think i am already in a main function oh this one fine now you can see the d word it is actually the hello word the string that we added and uh, i mean it is calling some puts this is actually a topic for uh, a different video uh, i'm just trying to uh, bring this to you now you can see the value uh, hexadecimal of 14 which is nothing but the value of 20. Uh, let me show this display as signed decimal the value is 20. so we actually passed the value 20 we passed value 20 and value 10 okay and here you you see the value 10 so what it is hap what is happening it is actually moving these arguments so we are passing this as an argument 10 and 20 so it is passing the arguments 20 and 10 into stack you can you see it is actually passing into stack stack pointer so that's what i mentioned in the theory uh, I go here and uh, local variables it is actually push it push it into the stack from memory so that's what happening here it's actually pushing it into stack and uh, the next one is add so this is the function it's a function call so before it is doing all this function call it is loading this uh, arguments and uh, it is actually setting this prologue okay now it is calling the function so here you can see the function definition i'm just double clicking this and i'm going to the function definition so here in this function definition you can see it is actually pushing the ebp once again the stack the the, the prologue and uh, it is actually setting the uh, it's actually doing that operation uh, where is that addition operation you may see it is adding the value of uh, the D register and also the A register the value present in D register is nothing but the argument 1 and the pre value present in A register is nothing but argument 2 so the both these values gets added and this value gets stored in the A register accumulator register because when I was explaining the accumulator register I clearly mentioned uh, the uh, what I can say yeah the result of arithmetic operations are often stored in this register so what that's what happening here 
uh, it's adding two values and storing it into arith uh, arithmetic register uh, sorry accumulator register fine now what what happens uh, yeah that's what so once it is done it is actually uh, returning to the return address the return address is nothing but the main function so it is coming back to the main function uh, i think somewhere here yeah so it's coming back to main function and uh, it prints the value eventually that's what happened so i i think i I, 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 I explained this so prologue and epilogue and the flow of the program execution a little clear with this and uh, yeah this is what uh, I actually wanted to explain uh, I can understand uh, this became a long video but I hope it worth you, you learned something new something significant right uh, that's what I all wanted I just wanted to teach this to you um, yeah, this is actually a basic stuff for uh, reverse engineering. Uh, we just understood the architecture of CPU. In the upcoming videos, I'll try to uh, I'll try to continue this series. I'll try to make uh, a video about the assembly instructions, how to read an assembly code, and uh, uh, how to dissect the PE uh, file, and uh, how to understand each section of PE file because that's essential in malware analysis. When you are up against any exe file or uh, msi file uh, msi is a different format i suppose when you are up against any exe file or any type of pe file you uh, you you tend to i mean you often uh, open it in a pe editor or uh, a, a pe file uh, reader and you try to understand its structure and also when you have a knowledge of uh, cpu uh, architecture it will be easy for you to visualize what exactly happened at the lower level all right so that was my intention and uh, yeah i uh, hope you really enjoyed you have learned something new uh, uh, if you really did learn something new consider uh, doing all the youtube algorithms like comment subscribe everything and i'll i'll see you next time with another exciting one until then i'm signing off cheers and uh, i love you all thank you so much